Officially now, hello everyone and welcome to this online lectureship, uh, which is a result of the joint read of the joint two research projects. One is funded by Croatian Science Foundation, dedicated to cognitive and ethical values of and aesthetic values of narrative art. And the other one, which is kind of our primary concern today, is a research project or kind of developed or fun funded by University of Rijeka which is dedicated to the post-digital post art and the ethical and ontological issues relating post-digital art, but with a primary focus on artificial intelligence. And we have with us today uh, two of its leading investigators, Professor Tomislav Brajnovic and Professor Inga Fulep from the, uh, univer from the Uni University of Rijeka Faculty of the Applied Arts. This is also uh, organized as part of the PhD program that we have at the Department of Philosophy, Philosophy and Contemporaneity. And some of my students are extremely interested in the, all the possible philosophical problems that are related to the artificial intelligence and its use and implementation in the creation and appreciation of art. And with this series of lectures, our first guests today are Professor uh, Dr. Nick Young and in absentia Dr. Enrico Terone, both are from the University of Genoa, and they have a research project dedicated to the artistic, if I understand it, artistic status of artificial intelligence and its involvement in artificial, sorry, in creation and appreciation of art. So that Dr. Young, thank you so much for being with us. It is our great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you for agreeing to do this, for sharing your work with us. And now I invite you to maybe tell us a few words about the project, about your engagement and your role in it. And we can then proceed to discussing your very, very, very interesting and for me personally mind opening paper. So thank you. Oh, that was a very lovely introduction. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, thank you for inviting uh, Enrico, who cannot make it, unfortunately. And um, yeah, so my name is Nick Young. I am a postdoc on Enrico Taroni's research project. The name of that research project is the philosophy of experiential artifacts. And this was devised by Enrico. Very broadly, what he is interested in doing is connecting up work in the philosophy of the art and the philosophy of aesthetics with work on technical artifacts. So there's obviously, I think everyone listening here is familiar with aesthetic work and philosophy of art. Um, Enrico is also interested in tools and tool use and how people make artifacts. So not just pieces of art, but anything. So yeah, a hammer, a screwdriver, a chair, a car. And what sort of as a broad definition of what we could understand an experiential artifact to be is anything that was designed with the primary function of being way. And if, if you think about it, that encompasses all forms of art, pretty much. I don't know, maybe you could make an argument about conceptual art and it wouldn't quite fit, but almost all forms of art, but also things that are still designed to be experienced, which are not necessarily works of art. So things like diagrams, things like um, something I want to talk about is maybe typefaces or writing, things like that. So a typeface is arguably not a work of art, but it is still something that is made to be experienced by people. When it comes to um, what I'll be talking about today, this is slightly tangential to what the, the project is about. What is interesting is its um, creation with AI is a particularly interesting form of um, cr the creative process. As, as I, we talk about in the paper, it's, it's coming in about how we should understand works of art made through these new, very new and sort of very exciting um, processes that have just come to prominence in the last few years. Um, I think that should do for now, if that's okay with you. And if it's all right, I'll take a sip of my tea and I'll start the talk. Um, just one thing is I have a bad habit of talking quickly. So if I'm not making sense, please do send a message or wave your hands or something like that. Okay, so yeah, please don't be afraid of doing that. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, so 
this is the the broad question we're starting with, which is how should we characterize characterize the role of AI systems in the making of art or in the creation of works, if you like. Okay, we're going to focus on a text to image program called Mid Journey. Okay, this is the one I know the most about. Um, last last year, I was um, I was not working because I had some health issues, and I spent a long time procrastinating with this program. So it's quite nice to be able to use that time I spent playing around with this uh, and turn it into some philosophy as well. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief introduction to what Mid Journey is in just a moment, and but just that part in the brackets on this slide as well. We like to think these sorts of things I'll be talking about today can be generalized to other forms of AI creation. Uh, me and Enrico and um, the head of department here at Genoa, uh, Marcello Fuzione, we've been trying to get ChatGBT to write poetry as well. And we think maybe what I talk about today could be generalized to that. Um, there's also very interesting stuff just coming now. It's very early days. But um, you can have things, Google is working on a text to music system, which is you can type in a prompt, you can say a classical piece of music in the harmonic minor key played on, yeah, played by a full orchestra. And you'll get something which is not quite there yet, not very beautiful, but interesting. So maybe in a year from now, we'll be talking about that a little bit more. So a brief introduction to Mid Journey, you might have, People who haven't heard of this before, you might have seen pictures like this float around the internet on the last six months. Um, it became something of a meme because what you can do is you can type in a scene from one movie, for example, and then you can say, in the style of another director. So you people got very excited about saying, well, this is Star Wars in the style of Wes Anderson. Okay, and this is The Shining in the style of Wes Anderson as well. So Wes Anderson, a director with a very, yeah, a very sort of distinctive look and distinctive enough for mid-journey to be able to recreate it or do a facade of it at least. So I'm not gonna be talking about this type of work. I think it's interesting. Um, and I think it's where most people have heard about mid-journey, but I'm gonna be talking about other types of art today for the most part. So brief, basically, I'm not gonna to talk to you about how mid-journey works. It is interesting, but it's not directly relevant to what I'm talking about here. I'm talking much more about just the, the experience of somebody using Midjourney to create and how we should characterize Midjourney's role in that creative process. Um, you might have also heard of things like DALI and Stable Diffusion. They are doing more or less the same sort of work that Midjourney is doing. Um, so yeah, I prefer Midjourney, it's the one I know the best. I think it's probably at the moment at least the best quality, but you might have seen things like Dali, especially floating around the internet. So I'll just give you a few examples of non Wes Anderson related images in a moment. But very broadly, mid journey for the user would work like this. Very simply, you can type in some words in the text box, you wait a minute or so, and mid journey will give you an image. You can be very specific about what sort of image you want mid journey to do. You can tell it, well, I want a painting, and you can say an oil painting, a watercolor, a photo, a comic book panel. You can even ask it for things like a photo of a sculpture, something like that. You can also tell it to make a picture in the style of an artist. So you can say in the style of Wes Anderson, in the style of Anson Kiefer. You can also do interesting things with the aspect ratio. And there are two variables um, about how stylish and how weird the image is. And these are, you'll, you'll see them in a moment when I show you what they are, but they're just sort of variables you can play with which influence the type of image you get back out from Mid Journey. And very importantly for what we'll be talking about later on, you can also iterate on images that Mid Journey creates. So you can type in a text, it will give you a picture, and then you can say, okay, Mid Journey, use that picture you gave me as a starting point and I'm gonna slightly change this prompt, and then Midjourney will give me another picture, and it'll be slightly developed, and another picture, and you can just work like that. So that will come back in a little while. So here are a few examples of non-Wes Anderson related works. So you can get these quite nice stylish photos out of there. Um, you can also do pseudo digital image creation as well. Um, you can do, yeah, sort of more, more abstract things here as well. Um, another one that might have been famous, you might have seen on the internet as well, 
is um, Jodorowsky's Tron as well. So, sorry, I've written Jodorowsky phonetically because I always forget how to pronounce the name. I am not a movie buff like Enrico. But um, Jodorowsky, famous uh, film director, made very arty films in the, I think, the 70s and some of the 80s. Uh, Tron was a, a science fiction movie from people of a particular age's childhood. And you get these sort of very beautiful, at least in my opinion, very beautiful images, which sort of take some of these, the costume ideas from a Jodorowsky movie and apply this to a much more sort of mainstream science fiction thing. So, first thing you might want to think about with something like Mid-Journey, when we're thinking about how should we characterize the role of Mid-Journey in the creative process. So there's me typing into Mid-Journey and then Mid-Journey is giving me pictures. What should we think Mid-Journey is, yeah, what, how should we characterize Mid-Journey? I mean, one way you could do it would be to say, well, Mid-Journey is, it's, it's an artist. Okay, that might be one way you think of it. You could say, well, who deserves the credit for those pictures I just saw you, showed you? Not the people who typed in the prompts, but mid-journey, the, the program itself. Okay, so that might be one way you want to go. I'm sceptical, and I think the majority of people working in this area would be sceptical that we should give, uh, we should say that mid-journey is an artist. Okay, so there's a very recent paper by Anscombe, uh, and she gives, I think, quite a clear reason to believe that we shouldn't be considering mid-journey artists. And Midjourney and other AI systems like ChatGPT, they don't seem to have intentional states. Um, so if you think about human artists, very basically a human artist intends to paint a picture or intends to create some art and believes that putting canvas, sorry, putting paint on canvas would be a way to achieve this. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any reason at all to think that Midjourney or ChatGPT or any of these things have intentions or beliefs or desires or tastes or anything like that. So it seems strange to think of Midjourney as an artist in this way, or as a creator in this way. But just focusing, yeah, I talk about this a little bit in the paper, just focusing on Anscombe's um, paper a little bit more. She, although she says this, although she says we shouldn't think of uh, Midjourney or AI systems as artists she still refers to them throughout the paper as agents okay she'll say ai agents throughout and she also says in the conclusion of her paper that they should or sorry they might in some cases deserve and this is the quote some share of the production credit and she gives us two two reasons or she touches on two reasons why she thinks maybe they should get some care of the some share of the production credit one is they can work autonomously, um, which means I can type something in and then it will, Midjourney will just do something. It will create an image in that minute or so. And it will also operate iteratively. Okay, so it's one way it's gonna make pictures is it'll make a single image, evaluate it, change the image, evaluate it again and do this iteration loop. And she suggests that maybe they should deserve some form of production credit because they contribute to the formal properties of the images that they're creating. Um, although I agree with what she's saying about the intentional states and not considering them artists, I find this not especially convincing. Um, oh, sorry, beg your pardon. One more thing about Anscombe as well. Um, if she says we should give, we should suggest they get credit for contributing to formal properties of the artwork, she mentions that this is works better if you think of artistic value as just aesthetic value, if you have a modest conception of aesthetic value, meaning that the only only thing artistic value really is, is these formal aesthetic properties, okay? So that, you know, the arcs of the curves in the image or the beautifulness of the painting or something like that. Whereas people like Nick Zangwell might be considered monists in this way. Pluralist conceptions of art, they would say, well, Artistic value is not just these formal aesthetic properties, but also perhaps the intentions behind the image or the ethical concerns that the image raises, something like that. And Anscombe just says, yeah, if you're a monist, then maybe you are more tempted to say that we should give Midjourney or AI systems some credit. Um, but if you're a pluralist, 
clearly Mid Journey does not have ethical opinions or issues it's trying to raise or anything like that. So it seems less likely you're going to think that Mid Journey deserves that much artistic credit. Okay, but back to my sort of worries about this, this sort of view. First of all, it seems very strange to me that she's still calling Mid Journey an agent, given that she's happy to say that Mid Journey doesn't have mental states. Okay, so when, when would you ever call something an agent if it doesn't have beliefs or desires or intentions or anything like that? And it also seems quite strange to me to talk about it taking Mid Journey possibly deserving some of the production credit, whether you're a monist or a pluralist. Um, credits, again, are things we tend to give to agents. If you think about the credits at the end of a movie, it's people, okay? Or it's organizations consisting of people like the state of California or something like that. And the scenery and the props contribute to a movie in a way because you wouldn't be able to have a, a scene at a kitchen table without a table but it's not like you give the table any credit. The table doesn't appear in the credits of the movie, okay? Because it's not an agent, okay? They used that table to make it. Um, and her two justifications in her paper, as I said, were iterative processes, that mid journey is iterative, or sorry, that AI systems generally can be iterative and that they can also work autonomously. Again, I don't see why these should give us any reason to think that Mid Journey deserves any sort of credit here. Okay, credit that we would give an agent. Okay, the evolutionary process is iterative because creatures are born, they have children, those genes mutate, mutations might or might not help the propagation of progeny. Um, and that's an iterative process, but we don't give the natural world any, we don't say well done world or bad world for having this iterative process. And similarly, when she's talking about autonomous processes, so processes we don't have full control over, again, you wouldn't necessarily give a process which is autonomous any sort of credit, like we've got a person. Here's a quick sort of example about why we wouldn't. So imagine me and Enrico are making an art project together where he pours some red wine into a, into a glass and I take photos of that wine being poured like this. This is mid-journey generated, by the way. This is not what we did. The, the liquid being poured in there, it's behaving in an autonomous way, okay? Because me and Enrico don't have complete control over how it's swirling around and how it's splashing about, all these sort of swirling processes. I'm taking photos of it. I'm in control of that. But the water, sorry, the, the wine itself is autonomous in the, because I do not have control over it. But again, you're not going to give the wine any any credit. You're not going to say, well done wine for doing this, this amazing thing. So that's all I'm going to say about Anscombe's paper today. And the reason I don't, I want to talk more about that positive stuff, but at the moment anyway, in short, I don't think there's any good reason to think of mid journey or any type of AI system as an artist or an agent or deserving any sort of production credit. Now, you might think, okay, you might agree, I'm hoping you'll agree with me on this. And you might think, well, there's a, there's a much more straightforward and intuitive way to characterize mid-journey, which is mid-journey is a type of tool. Okay, so there's a quote from Hertzman. And Hertzman is not the only person who would talk about um, AI systems like this as tools. Um, so you might think, well, maybe mid journey is something analogous to a painter's brush or a sculptor's chisel or a photographer's camera, or a, I don't know, a, I think you can do some more yourselves. And I'm not gonna give, I'm, I don't think this is as obviously incorrect as I think the, the agent and artist thing is, but I do think that there is, there is a couple of reasons to think that we shouldn't think of AI systems in this context as tools. And this is mid-journey, as I've mentioned, is unpredictable in a way that other tools are not. And if you think about a skilled painter, so someone who really knows how to paint, she is gonna be in close to complete control over how the paint 
is distri distributed across the canvas. Um, so her paintbrush, she can, can she has very fine degrees of control over how paint is being applied using her paintbrush. Similarly, a photographer, um, she can point her camera whatever she likes. If she's an analog photographer, she is in control over how that photo is developed as well, and the film she's using, things like that. Mid journey, I think, is much less like that. Just a couple of things to mop up. First of all, unpredictability, and I'm when I'm saying mid journey is unpredictable. I don't think I'm not using that in the way to mean unreliable, because of course you can have unreliable tools. Your your paintbrush, you might buy a cheap paintbrush. And it might snap if you apply too much pressure or a, a terrible camera that just can't capture things properly. Or sometimes maybe the button sticks. It would be unreliable there. That's not what I'm talking about here. Midjourney is, is a very reliable piece of software. It doesn't break down very often, but its outputs are unpredictable for the user. Um, I can type in a particular prompt and I'll show you some more examples later on. I can type in a particular prompt and although I can have, exert some control over the image that's getting pushed back at me, I'm never going to be able to control what image I get in the same way a painter or a photographer would. There's something just inherently unpredictable about mid-journey. So I have a very dry throat today, so I'm going to keep sipping my tea. Now, another thing that you might think as well is you can say, well, Painters don't have complete control. Watercolors is a, maybe a good example here because watercolors, sometimes the, the paint will spread too quickly or you won't be able to know exactly how it's gonna be absorbed by what you're painting on. Okay, your, the color might change slightly as it's added to the, the canvas as well. So you might say, well, this doesn't, this means that mid journey is not interestingly unpredictable. In, in, yeah, interestingly unpredictable. And what I would say to that um, is that when you think about things like watercolors, they are, they, yeah, maybe they're not entirely reliable. They're not a hundred percent in, but the artist is not a hundred percent in control, but the difference is there, especially in the hand of a skilled artist, it's about the fine details. Okay. So it will just be not quite control over exactly atom for atom how the watercolor paint is distributed on the canvas. But these are quite small details here, similar about the, the developing fluid you use. That might be, you might not be able to control exactly how that works when you're developing a photo. And maybe it's gonna make slight changes to the final result, but not anything especially significant when you have a, a skilled artist. mid journey, though, it, it seems inherently unreliable. Part of the process is a, a system which is giving you something which you cannot control completely. So this is, this is at least a reason for thinking that mid-journey is either not a tool or a tool which is really quite different to all other tools or most other tools we can think of. Okay, there's, no, maybe we can talk about that in discussion. There's maybe a couple of edge cases there as well, but let's continue for now because I want to get to our positive proposal. And if you haven't read the paper, you might think, well, what else could mid-journey be? Okay, if it's not an artist and if it's not a tool, what else could it be? And we think, as you might have guessed by the title of the talk, we think maybe the better analogy is gardening. I should prelude this by saying I am not a gardener. I don't think I've grown anything. Um, I've learned a little bit about for the purpose of this paper. If there's a gardener here who thinks I'm getting things very wrong, you can uh, embarrass me in the questions and answers. But uh, I'm hoping still what I say about gardening here is pretty much right. So I might skip that today. We'll come back to that. Another. That's in the talk, in the paper, but I think I'll skip that for the time being. And I'll come back to that. So, no, no, sorry, let's, let's start with this. So a phrase that um, Spinoza and Bruno used is to describe the dynamic, organic, unpredictable generative capacity found in nature. They say that's natura naturans which is nature generating itself, dynamically generating itself. And nature, natura naturans, is something you're, we as human beings do not have complete control over. So 
imagine you're a gardener, you have some sunflower seeds. As long as you throw those sunflower seeds into the soil uh, and make sure that they get enough light and enough water, hopefully you're going to grow some sunflower seeds. But you're not going to be able to say, you're not going to be able to control how many leaves are on the stalks of these seeds or how precise, how the, the height of the sunflower seeds precisely. You couldn't say, I'm going to grow a one meter long sunflower seed because you're either going to keep feeding it with sunshine and water and it's just going to keep growing until it dies. Or if it gets to a meter, you might want to cut off though. If you just stop giving it water and light, it's going to die. Uh, and of course, if you chop off the head, you might get it down to one meter, but then you no longer have a sunflower. Okay, You just can't control exactly how that sunflower is going to grow. We want to suggest that mid-journey is something similar to the natural environment in which a gardener might grow flowers or other plants, of course. Um, Mid-journey, as we've sort of hinted at in the tool section, it's a semi-autonomous system and it has a dynamic and unpredictable output. So a little bit more about gardening here. I think I've said most of this already yet. So a garden is something that a gardener can only ever have incomplete control over. Okay, it's, an, it's a system that the gardener can try and coax into behaving how he wants it to behave or growing how he wants it to grow. But as I just mentioned, he can never really specify precisely like a painter might be able to. Okay, and so there's, there's very little philosophy of gardening. Okay, it's, there's a couple of papers that I can't even get hold of because they're not online. One person who has written about it in um, a companion to aesthetics, a person called Cooper, and this is a nice line from Cooper. He says, the gardener is a creative agent who is nevertheless thoroughly dependent on the cooperation of natural processes. We want to say, just to give you a little bit more detail, we want to say mid -journey, the relationship between the user of mid-journey, the prompter, and mid-journey itself is very similar to that of gardener and garden, uh, which mid-journey is a, an environment, an autonomous system under the incomplete control of the user, of the prompter. So if we paraphrase Cooper's quote, we can say, the prompter is a creative agent who is nevertheless thoroughly dependent on the cooperation of pseudo-natural processes. Um, oh, that's a duplicate. Just one more thing here. We think the analogy with gardening and mid-journey prompting is a very good one. At the same time, there are limits to this analogy as well. I'm not gonna flag them up here, but there are ways you can maybe say, well, it's not exactly the same, but we think the analogy go takes us quite a way to understanding how we should characterize mid-journey. But maybe we can talk about that a bit more in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit more detail about how this is supposed to work. Um, and we're talking about iteration. Take another sip, sorry. So, as I mentioned to you before, the interesting thing about mid-journey is you can, it'll give you an image, it'll give you, and then you can say, well, change this, I'm going to change the prompt and use that image as a, as a starting point, and you get derivative images. I'll give you an example in just one moment. We want to try and say that this sort of iterative generation of images can be thought analogous to the way a gardener deals with his garden. So imagine a gardener plants some rose hips and then some rose plants grow, okay, but they don't flower. And so the gardener, if he knows what he's doing, can use various techniques to try and coax or persuade these the, the roses to bloom. So one way you can do this is you can um, prune the, the plants early on in the season. And if you do that, then you're more likely to get blooming flowers. And so you might think, yeah, the gardener prunes his plant, but sometimes nature just doesn't cooperate and he still doesn't get blooming flowers, any rose blooms. And so if that's the case, the, the gardener might want to try another trick, might want to do something else to encourage it. So this is something I learned on the internet. Apparently you can put banana peel into the soil and this will encourage flowers to bloom. Um, something to do with the potassium inside bananas is good for the soil and can encourage flower blooming. Okay, so imagine that, yes. Yeah, so his first step pruning doesn't work this time, it might work other times. 
Um, so he uses the second step and hooray, he manages to get his flowers to bloom. Now, let's think of an analogous situation with mid journey here. So you could type in a prompt, photo of roses, and you wait a minute and you'll get some images of red roses, let's assume in this case. But then you see these pictures and you go, well, I don't want, I like the way they frame the picture, but I don't want red roses, I want white roses. So what you can do is you can take the prompt and instead of saying, you can say mid journey, use this picture as a starting point, but look at this new prompt. This new prompt says white roses, not just roses. Sometimes, as we will see, um, mid journey doesn't cooperate in this iterative process. It's not guaranteed that if I change the prompt in this way, that the next image I receive is gonna be just of some white roses. Sometimes mid journey is quite stubborn and it gives me more red roses. So I go, ah, this isn't working. And in the same way, the gardener tried a different technique when pruning didn't work. I'm gonna try a different technique when just change, at specifying the color didn't work. So what you can also do, you can say, okay, use that picture as a starting point, but this time I've added white roses and I've also put at the end, dash dash no red, which is a way of trying to forbid mid journey to use a particular color or anything. If I didn't want people in the picture, I could also say no people, something like that. And let's say in this example, it, it works. I get what I want. I get a picture of some white roses. So I'm gonna give you a hopefully more interesting example than roses, but I'll just talk you through how this iterative process would work. So this is something I generated myself. Um, underneath you can see a the prompt that I used. And so the prompt that I used was a scarecrow in a snowy field surrounded by black birds and pink flowers in the style of one of my favorite artists, Anson Kiefer. And I've also added a couple of details, which have sometimes you can sort of yeah get more interesting results from mid journey by typing in things like hyper maximalist if you want lots of details, elegant and super detailed. And, and by the way, as a side point, an interesting thing that you can do with mid journey is if you want a beautiful picture, you can specify in the prompt, very beautiful. And that will give you more often beautiful pictures than if you don't type it in. It's quite interesting, I think. Um, and then just at the back, the AR, that's me specifying the aspect ratio. The C value is chaos. So you see, originally it's given me four pictures here. Chaos controls how different those four pictures will be from each other. Okay, so if it was a lower value, these pictures would be more similar. If it was a higher value, these pictures are more different. Okay, but still within the bounds of what I prompted. V4 is just the version and style is how stylized I want my image. What you would do now, let's imagine I like one of these images. You can now say to me, Journey, okay, I want picture two. And let's, let's use this as the base and let's create more with this image. So let's move on. This is image two. Okay, it's just the same as what we saw before, the same prompt underneath. Okay, basically now it's rendered in a slightly higher resolution. And just as you see that, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with the paintings of Anson Kiefer, but it is, it's, it's far from perfect, you know, an Anson Kiefer aficionado would be able to say, well, that's not a real picture, but it is interestingly similar to his style. Okay, this sort of wildness with the way colors are distributed, the sort of the details, but also the blurriness. It's quite interesting. Okay, but let's imagine that I want to use this picture, but I don't, I decide I don't really like the pink flowers. So what I do is I, I say, use this picture as a start and let's change pink flowers to green flowers. And this is what it gives me. It gives me four more pictures based on what I gave it. There's my change prompt underneath just to highlight what I've changed there. And it's giving me these four images. Notice here, it's not really cooperating with what I wanted. Okay, it's given me a lot more green, um, but I've asked for it to be surrounded by black blackbirds and green flowers. And I, maybe there's some green flowers on some of the, the jackets of the scarecrow, but there doesn't seem to be very many green flowers in the field. Okay, there's just sort of more green added, but not quite what I wanted here. So I'm not gonna go on and try and get into some green flowers here, but you can see how it's just not quite cooperating. So let's say I decide, okay, let's, let's give up on the green flowers. You've given me some green, I quite like this image. 
I just want to show you one more way that you can iterate on these on these images as well. So what I can do now, again, this is the new starting point. I've got some green, I kind of like it. You can also change the artist at this point. Okay, so what you can do is this. So again, this has taken my the image you just saw, but I've changed them. I've changed it from Anson Kiefer to a, a basically a famous British comic book artist from the 1980s. And you can see that it's it's changed the style now quite dramatically. It, you can still see, I mean, maybe there's a little bit of Anson Kiefer still in there. Okay, it's still got this sort of wildness, the way the, sort of the birds are sort of blurred around the place. But you can see it's looking much, much more like a comic book illustration. You've got like much broader line work. It looks like somebody's drawn in black ink outlines around some of this stuff. So you see, I just want to sort of show you how this iteration process works and how uncooperative mid journey can be at times, but also quite how creative you can be with a system like this. So I started with something that looked like an oil painting with lots of pink, and now I've ended with, um, with something that at least looks at least a little bit like a comic book, but also a little bit like an oil painting still, uh, with lots of green and sunflowers surrounding it. So and yeah, that's, that's sort of the iterative process that I wanted to spell out for you in a bit more detail. Um, one more thing about this, I don't know if anyone's used this type of a system before, it's extraordinarily addictive from the user front as well. Once I start doing this, and other people are the same, once you start playing around with this, it's very hard to tear yourself away from the computer. I, my pet theory for this is, you know how social media like Twitter, it's meant to be addictive because it's novelty. You can just keep refreshing the page on Twitter or on Instagram. And part of the reason why you just are conditioned to do this almost is because as soon as you click refresh, you get new things and new things and new things. And just as an aside, I think maybe something similar is going on with mid journey prompting because you always just get more novelty and more novelty and more novelty because you're not in complete control of the images it is feeding you back. So. Coming to the end now, well, maybe not quite. Um, so I told you, I've shown you this process. And now I want to sort of, I want to suggest to you and I don't think this is in the paper that you read, that maybe image creation this way, we should think of as a new medium. That's what we should characterize Mid Journey as, less of a tool and more of a new medium. So recalcitrance is a nice phrase. I think it comes from uh, Wolheim, although he doesn't develop it very much. And the recalcitrance of a medium is the challenges and limitations inherent in a medium that an artist navigates or uses. So you think of a, a sculptor and what's, what a good sculptor needs to be able to deal with is how to manipulate that piece of marble or a piece of other piece of rock in such a way that it starts to become depictive or imagistic in some way. Um, so apparently marble is very brittle so only a real skilled sculptor can use marble to do anything very well because it's very easy just to do one false move with your chisel and then a lump of the marble is just going to fall off. Okay, so you have to really develop this skill to deal with marble as a medium here. Similar with, similarly with oil painting, a challenge or a limitation of the medium is it can be quite difficult to mix your oil paints in such a way as to get the exact cue you want. Sorry, hue you want, not cue. Um, so you can imagine like a novice oil painter not really being able to get the exact shade of pink she would like for, for the flowers or something like that. Whereas a more advanced one would be able to get exactly sort of the light pink that they want. And Wolheim suggests that this is how we should dis differentiate different mediums, maybe even different forms of art. You can say, well, that's what makes oil painting a slightly different form of art to watercolors. Although there's still some challenges in common, which is getting paint onto a canvas, you can also say, well, they're slightly different because the watercolor artist faces different challenges and has to get better at different skills than the oil paint artist. The calcitrance is also been suggested by, in a recent paper by Thompson Jones on uh, film and digital film, that the calcitrance plays a particular 
role of um in the role of appreciation so if you know how hard sculpture is if you're a sculpture expert it's a there's a there's a an argument to be made that your aesthetic appreciation of a marble sculpture will be more sophisticated and have more factors coming in than someone who doesn't know about how difficult it is to sculpt marble because you'll be able to appreciate just how good the sculpture is by managing to get these intricate details in a, a brittle, a brittle, fragile lump of marble. And think about it like this as well. Imagine I show you a very beautiful drawing and you're impressed by it. Uh, but then I tell you that this drawing was actually created through somebody tracing. I projected an image onto a, onto a canvas and then they just drew around that image with a, a pencil. And then you might think, oh, and you might like that drawing a little bit less because you, I don't know, the strong way of putting this is you'd think, well, you've cheated. You haven't really drawn anything. You've just traced it. And so maybe your appreciation of the picture I'm showing you would be, yeah, less lower. So bring it back to mid-journey. Maybe we should think of mid-journey as a fairly distinct medium compared to the other image-making arts or the traditional image-making arts, um, because you're facing a fairly different type of recalcitrance here. So this is interesting because although Mid-Journey is giving us outputs, it's giving us artworks, which are similar in their formal property, superficially similar to that, would, that which would be produced by other, by traditional painters or drawers or photographers. The user of mid-journey is facing a fairly distinctive type of recalcitrance, which I've sort of already covered. I've shown you that it's you don't have complete control as to the layout of the image. You have mid-journey not wanting to do um, exactly what you're telling it to do, and you have to sort of iterate and try and push back in the same way the gardener has to coax and try different techniques and things like that. And so maybe because this type of recalcitrance is um, quite different, Maybe she, we should be thinking about mid-journey as a different, yeah, a significantly different medium than these other forms of art. And maybe also our appreciation of images made through mid-journey should also be informed by a knowledge of how the images are created and the difficulties that prompters face when they're creating these images as well. So, the interesting thing about this, though, is right now, because this type of art, art creation, image creation, it's so new, the majority of people have very little knowledge about how, about the sort of recalcitrance, the sort of dynamic problems that a mid-journey prompter would face. And so right now, we're perhaps, we, when we look at images like this, we're not appreciating them in terms of recalcitrance yet. We're maybe appreciating just in terms of formal properties about how beautiful they are. And also, like I showed you at the beginning, there's a, a temptation, at least on, online and on social media, to be very much interested in the novelty, to be very interested and say, hey, look, it's Freddy Krueger in the style of Wes Anderson. Okay, and so people are not maybe interested in um, how they're being made yet. And it's similar with gardening, okay? The vast majority of people, myself included, don't know precisely the details that gardeners face and how difficult or how easy it is for gardeners to grow particular things. So we can look at a garden and appreciate its formal properties and say, yes, it's very beautifully laid out. But perhaps an expert gardener would look at a, yeah, look at a gardener, sorry, look at a garden and realize quite how, quite what a, an achievement it is to have been made in this way because they can see the challenges that this gardener has overcome. So basically in a moment I can conclude, but if you want to have maybe two other slides at the very end. So how am I doing for time? I can keep going? Yeah, I think it's it, this is so interesting I'm, and we have the time. So if you That's don't mind. Of, so I think maybe just over five more minutes anyway, but yeah, yeah thanks. Okay, so I've now given you some ideas about maybe how we can appreciate it and how we should think of mid-journey as the creative process. So. I mentioned at the very beginning, um, hopefully we can expand, me and Enrico can expand this analogy to encompass other forms of AI-based creativity. So as I mentioned at the beginning, 
you can try and get ChatGPT to write poetry. ChatGPT is not quite there yet. Okay, it's very hard to get good um, poetry from ChatGPT right now. So as well as Enrico, we had um, Marcello Friccione helping us. Uh, he's the head of the department at Genoa, but also a fairly well-regarded published poet in Italy. And he just couldn't get it to do anything good yet. Um, but maybe in the future, maybe GPT-5 or GPT-6 will be better at this sort of stuff. Um, and again, you even when you make bad poetry with it, you do have this iterative back and forth going on again. You can say, chat GPT, write me a poem, and uh, it'll give you something terrible. Okay, and it's, chat GPT loves to make rhyming poetry as well. It's very hard to get it not to rhyme poetry. And so you say, okay, write me that again, but I don't want you to rhyme at all. And it'll go, okay, no rhyming. And then it'll give you a rhyming poem again. It'll just do this, it'll just keep rhyming. And you can say, don't rhyme. And you can occasionally persuade it not to rhyme. But the moment the recalcitrance is almost un, um, unimpeachable at this point, you just can't get it to do this sort of stuff. You can get it to write in the style of famous poems. So, sorry, famous poets. So potentially you could get into the process that I showed you with Mid Journey, where you can get it to write a poem out in the style of John Donne, and then you can say, okay, now rewrite that slightly, but make it sound a little bit more like Rudyard Kipling or something like that. So you could use this up in a similar way, but currently uh, it's terrible, but maybe in the future. So, and yeah, you could probably do a similar thing once Google's music stuff gets more, more sophisticated also. So just to conclude, and then I've got two more extra points, just which we're less sure about, but might be useful for the discussion. So just in conclusion, just to sum up, we don't think Midjourney is an agent, and neither do we think it deserves artistic credit, creative credit. We don't think Midjourney is a tool, or if it is, it's a very strange one. Um, what we do think, though, is Midjourney and other AI interfaces like it are new types of medium, somewhat similar to a garden. And they present creators with a distinct garden-like form of dynamic recalcitrance. So that's the end. And then just a couple of other sort of things that we're working on and worrying about. So not how much credit should we give Midjourney the program, but how much credit should we give Midjourney Incorporated, Incorporated? So the company in San Francisco that made Midjourney, the one that the one that the University of Geneva is paying 25 euros a month to for me to do, play around with. So a gardener works with a natural environment, okay? So unless you're a deist, nobody made that environment, okay? That environment is a product of evolution. Mid-journey was made, was created by people. And so you might think, well, when you're looking at these images that have been made by Mid-journey, how much credit should we give Mid-journey incorporated? Okay, there is, if, if they hadn't made this program, I wouldn't have been able to show you all these images. And as I said, we're still kind of working on this. What I think, what I think I want to say, I'm not sure Enrico would agree with me here, but what I think I want to say is we should give exactly as much credit as we would to someone who had made an environment in which we make a garden. And the best analogy I can get here for you is bonsai. So if you look on Amazon, you can buy bonsai starter kits and you can get very cheap ones and you can get extremely expensive ones. I have not bought any of these, but presumably these sets, the price will have something to do with the quality. I would hope that if I pay 400 euros for a bonsai kit, I'll be able to get a better bonsai tree than I would if I pay 20 euros. So presumably the better quality one is giving you more fertile soil or I don't know, more expensive seeds or seeds that will grow into better looking bonsai trees. And in that case, you might see my bonsai creation and then you might say, yeah, okay, well, Nick, you definitely deserve some artistic credit for creating such a beautiful bonsai tree. But at the same time, you might wanna say, well, yes, yeah, some proportion of that credit should go to the people who created the starter kit as well. And then we can have a, an argument about how much. But what I think we should say is more or less the same way you'd wanna divide the credit out between bonsai gardener and bonsai starter kit creator, 
I think probably whatever you think is right in that case, I'd want to say you want to think the same about the mid-journey prompter and mid-journey the company. And, oh yeah, final thing I should have mentioned as well is, as I mentioned, there are different text to image models. Um, and at the moment, as far as I can tell, mid-journey is the best. Stable diffusion seems pretty good. DALI 2 is not great these days. So in the same way, you might want to say, well, DALI 2 are giving me a, a cheaper bonsai kit and mid-journey are giving me a better bonsai kit as well. Yeah, okay, yeah, I won't talk about mid-journey anymore. I have some... Okay, so final, final points here. Another thing you might want to think about with credit is, and this is also something you'll see online quite a lot, is there's a lot of controversy here about how much credit we should give to the artists in the training set. So Midjourney, the company, when they made Midjourney, they fed it an enormous amount of photos and paintings and illustrations and comic books and whatever else you can and social media photos and you know billions of images that were fed into the training set and then you might say well if i add van gogh to a prompt how much and it looks, it looks a little bit like van gogh or like um i added Anson kiefer and it looked a little bit like Anson kiefer how much credit should i giving Anson kiefer am i stealing from Anson kiefer are mid journey stealing from Anson kiefer and this, we don't have a, a strong opinion yet on this. Um, this so I don't know. This is so. This is more. This is more going to my intuitions now. Um, it doesn't feel like I'm stealing when I use Mid Journey in this way. It doesn't feel like. Imagine if I was making a piece of music and I just found a melody and added that melody to my piece of music. That would feel like stealing. But it seems when I'm using Midjourney, it almost seems like I'm using the names of artists, almost like just as an extra ingredient. So I can say oil painting, and I can say Unsum Kiefer, and then I'm just throwing these prompts in, and I can throw them in and take them out and throw in different, throw in different names and different artistic techniques. And so from the user, at least from my user experience, I don't feel like I'm just taking something from Van Gogh and just adding it to my thing. I'm kind of just using my knowledge of Van Gogh to influence how my mid-journey image grows. So this is not quite a philosophical argument yet. Um, and just a final point there, the second from the last thing is, where do we draw the difference between traditional artists being influenced by their predecessors? So, you know, movie directors might, you might see an image in a movie and say, oh, that's, clearly a reference back to some old David Lynch movie. And yet you wouldn't think that this director is stealing from Lynch. You might just say, well, he's show it, he's paying homage or he's influenced by. It. So I think maybe that is also relevant to this sort of discussion. And this is the very last slide, I promise. So with all of this in mind, what is interesting about this type of image creation or this type of artistic AI generated image creation in general? is it gives connoisseurs a way of creating interesting, perhaps artistically valuable images. So you, in traditional arts, you might have two types of people. Maybe sometimes they overlap, but they don't necessarily overlap. You might get people who are really amazing at painting, and you might get people who are experts at painting and know everything about the history of painting. They can look at a painting and they can say, ah, influenced by this school of art, and this movement and reflects the times in this way. And they can tell you everything about painting, but they cannot themselves paint. It's what seems interesting about what I've said about this mid journey stuff here is maybe now these people, these connoisseurs, who, these talentless connoisseurs in a way, all these terrible painters, they now are in the position to perhaps give us the most interesting art from these sorts of um, systems because they, their vocabulary will be immense. So when I'm throwing words at Midjourney, I am by no means an expert in art history. I know a few words, you know, and I look at some paintings and I can say this style and that style and this artist. But if somebody, if there was a professor of art history doing this, they would be able to specify to a very fine grain the sorts of prompts that they want to put into Midjourney. And so potentially they're the people who are going to give us the best images, the most artistically valuable images from Midjourney. And I think I will end there. So thank you very much for listening.
uh, just to introduce, this is Xenia. She's my PhD student, exclusively dedicated to artificial intelligence, but she's also a trained academic musician. So she has extensive background in artistic creation and in artistry and in aesthetic values of music. So she's in her work, she's kind of combining her training in, in musicology and as a practicing musician with all these questions that are being raised by artificial intelligence. Oh, that sounds Senia. fascinating. Okay, Senia. can you please just confirm that you can hear me? I can hear you perfectly, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I agree on many, many points, especially on uh, viewing uh, AI as a medium. Um, what I have uh, to object is perhaps the gardening metaphor, and I have to object to it not uh, having in mind current uh, available models of AI, but the models that we will face in uh, not so far future. Actually, I was um, watching a couple of interviews with the AI engineers uh, during the past uh, couple of days, and it is the advancement is just mind blowing. Um, and I've seen. Um, I'm I'm sorry. It it sounds like I'm going off the point, oh, but no, um, actually I will I will I will bring it back. So basically, I've seen that um, uh, AI can uh, at this point uh, not only um, read the people's minds in terms of. Um, uh, telling us uh, what sentence they are thinking or what picture they are envisaging, but uh, it can actually, um, I don't know, there was a test group of people and they were played a song and then AI reproduced from reading their uh, brain waves, reproduced the song that yet they were listening. I mean, okay, it's it doesn't sound quite like Pink Floyd, what the AI reproduced, uh, but it was close enough to be recognizable. Mm -hmm. So it is an impressive result. And that, now how it fits? Well, uh, you uh, compare um, working with uh, mid-journey with gardening. Yeah. And uh, the first thing I was reading your I was reading your uh, work and um, uh, from uh, my first was uh, the sort of excitement. OK, now we are thinking about it in, in a more creative way, but something wasn't fitting. And now I think I found the point where, where it's not fitting. Um, well, mm -hmm. the earth and natural environment doesn't work um, incredibly hard to meet our desires. And AI models are, it seems to me, they are progressing to the point where they could be able to actually read our desires before we are even aware of them. So maybe in a couple of years, we will have AI systems that will produce me an image that I didn't even know that I wanted. So uh, it's kind of, it's kind of um, counter, uh, counter, it goes against my intuition because a gardening is like playing an instrument. It's incredibly hard. You have to work on it. It's uh, a transformative process when you, where you have to meet your own limitations and you have to meet the limitations of the instrument and also the limitations of environment. And you don't, of course, uh, you are right. You don't always get, get predictable and the uh, result that you actually wanted. But with AI systems, I think we are on a good way to actually get exactly what we want without even defining what we want. OK, that was very interesting. Um, thank you. Let me let me see where I should start with that. So OK, so let me tell me if this is some somewhat answering your question. So what you described this sort of the, the neural neuro stuff, I, I'm not familiar with that stuff myself. It does sound I think I've heard something about it, but it sounds very very, cool. very new. It's very new. It's it's been only a couple of days on the internet. Oh, oh very, very new then. Okay. Um I wonder there whether if you were creating images in that way, then I think probably I would hold my hands up and say yeah, that's that is just not going to work for the model I've described here. Um, but I'm not sure. I maybe you disagree. I'm not sure we need to worry about that too much because although you're using AI and yeah technology to sort of create images, your the process of creation is so different that I would probably want to say the medium is different, and so then the question of whether it's 
So then, then uh, yeah, I just want to say it's a different type of medium to what I've been describing here. Yes, yes, I agree absolutely that it's entirely different, and there is where, where I would. Um, I think we will have. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually make. I'm actually in the process of writing a paper for Professor Vidmar Ivanovic at this point, mm -hmm. and um, my own conclusions at this point, and they are very blurry, that we somehow need to um, make a division between uh, this kind of interaction with uh, AI models and um, separating uh, um, human art as a separate art precisely on the basis of uh, the process of creation, which is um, uh, which is nothing like ordering a prompt. Actually, I would compare ordering uh, an image from AI with uh, what um, wealthy people in the past and today do when they order a painting from an author. And they never get the result they exactly wanted because authors don't read minds and they just create paintings. No, no, that's a, it's, um, I was at, the, at this conference last week. John Kalvicki made exactly that point. I don't know if you know much of John Kalvicki's work, but he's, yeah, you're thinking exactly like he is with this. Um, let me come to the, the idea about um, art assistance in a moment, about what you just said there. Just a little bit more about the, the neuro based stuff. This is just, this springs to mind is maybe you would want to say that that is just a different form of art because the artist would face different forms of recalcitrance. So when, you, when you're saying, well, you can just plug it into somebody's mind and they, um, they think of the image they want and they get the image. Arguably, I'm no expert in this, but some people are supposed to be better and worse at um, mental imagery, right? Some people have very detailed mental imagery. Some people have very little mental imagery. Maybe the type of recalcitrance that somebody would face there would be being able to clearly bring a mental image to mind and maybe yes, yes, absolutely absolutely but if you have your personal ai assistant mm -hmm. who knows all of your preferences all that you watched in the recent 20 years or so all that you like in the recent 20 years or so and what you are currently thinking it's mm -hmm. not going to reproduce the image that is in your mind it is going just to combine what it finds i think it comes down to pure combina combinatorics actually it has the parameters and it knows what it what can be blissful for you. I, I think it's uh, I think we are not aware of how much impact this is going to have in the next years because people are always saying, well, but it well, well, but it's so clumsy, you can't really get what you said, you can't really get it to do what you actually want. But you know, it's now, and we, we have no idea what. Uh, we, the current GPT-4 is... Uh, Xenia, I, I you just, Xenia, sorry, but we have several other questions. Can yeah, you just... I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and okay. then in the next round, we can come back. Okay, with... okay. Um, but by the way, I should say to anyone, if we run out of time today, I'm happy to continue these conversations over email or stuff like that. You know, I'm really enjoying this topic. So, and you, it's nice to speak to people who are knowledgeable about the topic. So, yeah, if we don't have time today, I'll have plenty of time in the future. So, we'll Enrico, I think. Uh, Luna, Emma, Emma Luna. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to talk about, I use one of those apps, but another one, it's called uh, Dream, Wombo Dream. But it's a, it. Yeah, but it's a, it's a free app, so it's kind of, um, it's not a good quality. It has problems with, when you type in dog, it disfigures the dog. It's It really can be quite... <laughs> quite uh, disturbing. <laughs> uh, but what I wanted to ask, actually, you didn't talk about this in your uh, paper, but you mentioned it today, mm -hmm. uh, about software de developers who are working on mid-journey, uh, their role in this process, because to me, it seems that although, as you said, mid-journey has uh, a great deal of, of um, autonomy, also, people have programmed it, people have worked on it. And you mentioned that uh, the app also can, when you type in a beautiful or some kind of aesthetic um, term, that the app shows you uh, pictures that are, that are beautiful. And to me, it seems that um, a person or several people uh, must have learned, must have taught the app what is beautiful and what is not or there was a corpus, like an internet corpus from which the app learned this, because it's very interesting that 
the app shows us something that is beautiful in its opinion, so to say, and that also we agree with it. So I don't know how, I'm not an IT expert, so I don't know how they managed to do it, but I think it's uh, quite a, impressive. What do you think then is the role of uh, Midjourney as an income, uh, as a corporation and how uh, how do you think this program will move on forward? Do you think it will significantly improve or do you think it will come to a stalemate? Okay, that's really yeah, fascinating and definitely something I'd like to think about harder in the future. So, I mean, I think there's a, maybe you'd call it an ethical issue here. So, yes, certainly part of the training for image generators like this is human beings sitting in a room and making judgments. Uh, and so I'm not sure they're saying what's more beautiful or what is not. Oh no, they certainly are, because I've done some of this online for Midjourney. As a user, they invite you sometimes to, do, to judge pictures and they often say, which one do you prefer? And you have to choose between two. So you do have this. Um, and I think this is a danger for systems like Midjourney. So, I mean, partly because what is considered beauty it's, you know, someone is maybe not quite dictating it, but it is a particular conception of beauty. You know, so if I'm helping them, when I, when I do the, the, the choose the picture thing, if they're only talking to, you know, white academic men in Western Europe or the United States, then there's a very good chance that I'm going to be giving fairly similar answers to somebody who's living on the other side of the world. So there's a, I think there's a danger for mid yeah, yeah, not, but at the same time, I guess you could say, well, beauty is such a subjective thing anyway. You might want to say that. I don't know. One other thing about the, this, though, and I think you you really made me think of this is Mid Journey. I, the pictures I showed you today are Mid Journey version four. Mid Journey version five, I don't like at all. It's it's um it's much blander. The images I get are far less interesting and they're far more, it's really hard to get it, not just always with something directly in the center, for example. And I, I suspect this is because what a lot of people use Midjourney for is not the stuff I showed you. It's for getting photorealistic images and typically photorealistic images of good looking people. So my worry, is, so like, you know, models in their, particularly female models in their twenties. I think we mentioned this in the paper. It's very good at doing that. And so there's this danger, I think, that it's going to just blandify itself. So I think because you have a corporate entity with corporate aims, there is a danger that this will happen. Um, I think I don't know, the, one, the one spark of hope here is that I keep reading things saying these, these types of systems, what might win in the end is not Google or OpenAI or DALI, but um, open source. So there was a leaked memo a few months ago from Google saying, well, at least one engineer thought our competitor isn't Microsoft, it's open source, and we're going to lose because open source will be able to iterate so much quicker than we will. And so maybe open source software like this will lead to a more I don't know, democratic type of system that we can all work from. But that is maybe overly optimistic. And um, yeah, maybe maybe Google will win and we'll just be looking at very bland pictures for the rest of our lives. I'm not sure. Did that come close to answering what the point you were raising? Yes, it definitely did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. We have a question by Tomislav. Uh, just a little bit of the background. Tomislav has an extensive training in history of art and art criticism and logics. So that's kind of where he's coming from. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, I must say, I really enjoyed your uh, main analogy and especially with the main problem about the uh, question of uh, deeper appreciation of the images created uh, in that way. But um, it came to my mind, uh, let's say, maybe two possible problems um, uh, on the notion of uh, this. If I understood it correctly, so uh, the main characteristic of the AI uh, creating images is uh, semi-autonomous uh, process. Uh, semi-autonomous process. Yes, 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 that it is semi-autonomous, uh, as, as you said. So uh, two possible things. I think uh, someone had uh, in the uh, last week conference, I, I cannot um, uh, remember who, 
But at some point, uh, someone who was talking about uh, AI uh, had the notion, I think, uh, that the concept was um, the problem of opacity. So um, the problem that we don't know, as far as I know, uh, that we don't know deeply uh, the, the whole process in the background. Let's say how, how, the, how those things uh, works or how those things as, um, uh, uh, as AIs, uh, how they think. So for example, we don't know uh, in which way does he think, how does he create patterns, how does he mix uh, you know, different different uh, visual styles, different authors, uh, and, and so. So, so you're, just, you're talking about the the program here, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. So, so my problem to you, uh, my question to you is, what do you think about? It? I I don't know if you understood correctly the the problem. So, the the, the fact that we don't know fully the whole background, uh, the, the, the the whole processes that are like uh, going on. Um, while the, the images are uh, created. And the mm -hmm. uh, second thing uh, also, um, it came to my mind, uh, maybe uh, it would be a good point to point out that maybe the thing about semi-autonomy is not exclusively and totally new in the tradition of uh, creating arts with uh, AI. For example, you have a lot of different arts in the uh, second half uh, of the 20th century, which we can also call that on some way are not, um, they aren't only, you know, uh, um, they're on some level se semi-autonomous, uh, opposite to the uh, author, to their uh, uh, original author. For example, uh, um, different happenings, or different uh, kind of performances, uh, you know, where uh, um, public uh, and uh, the uh, spectators are engaged, and and some uh, let's say performances they somehow also create or uh, create the, the, the yeah, art. Yeah, they, they contribute to. For example, um, okay, uh, uh, land art is similar to <laughs> gardening, but uh, also for example, some sort of site specific arts. You know where, for example, uh, some artworks are let to be destroyed or to be uh, somehow, you know, let the nature be. Uh, for example, I don't know if you know those sculptures which are sunk into the sea. So the whole process of how the sea is, you know, somehow uh, um, through the time covering them with algae and, and mud. And so is the, it is also the part of the process. So. Part of the, yeah. Um, okay, thank you. And sorry, what was your name again? I can't see it on the screen for this one. Uh, Thomas, oh, sorry. Thomas, okay. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about the opacity question first. I'm interested to know what you think here because I, so from the user, what Mid Journey is doing is somewhat opaque. Mm -hmm. okay. So you, I don't exactly know how my, my prompt turns into those images or that image. Is that, I wonder how worried. I need to be about this. So um, a gardener need not know that much about biology, for example. Mm -hmm. They need not know that much about sort of how the sun, yeah, photosynthesis and things like that. They may, maybe this sort of knowledge will help, but at the same time, it's at least to me, it's quite easy to imagine a gardener who has no scientific training, no biological training at all, and yet still over time, can learn to produce a beautiful garden or grow something interesting like that. And so I, I guess I'm not quite sure, is that, is that something that you think I should be worried about still or is it just something you Well, maybe yes, because uh, the, the thing you mentioned now by uh, analogy, I would say then, okay, maybe that's similar uh, with the, the traditional arts with, you know, chemistry. Artists usually yeah. don't have to have a lot of knowledge in chemistry of paintings and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, the background knowledge I was referring to, which from my standing point, it seems relevant, is like artists, you know, know some, uh, a lot of theory of colors. So how do colors, uh, like the, the, the composition of colors and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe I think, yeah, the questions I asked, for example, how, uh, by which which patterns do AI follow when 
combining the, the, the different uh, formal ele visual elements and, and stuff like so. I think that maybe it is a, a, a relevant question, but I it's think to think about sure. I definitely have something to think about, and because you're you're again you're not the first person to raise a similar issue. So, uh, Elisa Caldorini, I think last week raised quite a similar issue as well. Um, and I need to think about this harder. I, mean, I haven't had a chance to talk to Enrico about this very much. Right now, I mean, just to stick on this one more, I know other people have questions as well, and you had a second part as well. Mm -hmm. um, the thing with color theory is again, yes, it might help traditional artists. It might inform their work and they might be creating better work like this. And it might well, in, you know, it might, it, I might improve my mid-journey prompting if I learn a little bit more about color theory as well. Um, but at the same time, it just seems there are different levels of artistic knowledge and you can still be creative without knowing, you could, yeah, you, it could depend on how much you know, but it doesn't necessarily preclude you from making interesting stuff. You can almost learn it like a craft, that is not quite right, or, or a knack, maybe something along those lines. Um, so I don't know, I, at the moment, I don't know if opacity is a, something I need to worry about, but it is definitely something I need to think about more and ask Enrico about as well. Um, sorry, give me a one sentence summary of the other thing you mentioned. I can't remember. Uh, the uh, forms of art in the second half of the 20th century, which we can also maybe call semi autonomous. I think you're, I think maybe that's true. Uh, I think, may, I don't, did you have a particular form of art in mind or a particular? Yeah, I, I mentioned doing... performances happening, ah. you know, they aren't always uh, yeah. like yeah. Uh, land art, site specific art. So, yeah, the, when you're sort of adding this extra sort of yeah autonomous elements in there. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is somewhat similar to what, to at least how we're conceiving of mid journey style art here. Um, because, yeah, the, the artist does not have complete control, and that's kind of part of the process. But, I mean, maybe one dissimilarity in terms of sort of interactive art would be that interaction and that autonomy and that unpredictability is actually part of the work rather than part of the creative process. Whereas what I've been talking about here is sort of using this unpredictability as part of the creative process. So maybe, but then again, there's maybe other musical, sorry, I think, I think serialism, there's stuff in music, I think you're rolling a die at points and having like this random, auto. Yeah. and so I don't know that much about serialism, but maybe if serialism where you're rolling a die, putting some notes in, iterating on those notes by rolling a die again, iterating again, then maybe I would want to say this is in the same category as maybe gardening or mid-journey art, but I'm not sure I'd want to put land art or performance art in the same way, because I think that seemed to be part of the, the, the work rather than the process. Um, sorry, can I, can I ask something also? Sure. Uh, what about um, when there's a, an authorship problem that is, or a dilemma that is actually dealing with the creative process? For example, when we think about Anthony Gaudi or Michelangelo, they, on, on some accounts, they had apprentices, and not all of Sagrada Familia was built directly by Gaudi. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, I noticed that people have this uh, notion that you know Gaudi Gaudi decided uh, what where he wanted to go with Sagrada Familia, and he taught his apprentices to emulate his style because he just couldn't do it all by himself. So there's also this problem of when we th when we think about uh, these kinds of situation, who who is actually responsible, the apprentice, or Gaudi, or both, and this is also a traditional type of art. So we're, when we have when we have dilemmas in this kind of context, then how can we not have these questions when it uh, when it deals with AI? It's really a complicated issue. No, it really is. Um... I should say that this is somewhat similar to something Senya mentioned earlier on as well about artist assistants and sending them off. Um, I should preface this by saying I'm not going to have a, a clear, a perfect answer for you here, but I think it's definitely an interesting uh, AI, the sort of systems I'm talking about definitely have this sort of interesting tension there. Um, so so Senya, may, Senya mentioned sort of artists would go off and send their assistants to produce certain parts. And what I was going to say to her was, in those cases, I always assumed that the artist 
the leading artist is the person who says, no, you've done it wrong, or no, you haven't got it quite right. I always assumed that they had a real quite control. The Gaudi example you gave me, though, is a really interesting case because it sound, the way you described it, it sounded like he wasn't just telling people what to do. He was kind of telling people how to emulate his style, right? And that's... Do you think well, you... yeah, sorry, I'm not an art historian and I have read uh, a bit about it, but I'm not exactly sure what... That, that was exactly my point, that I'm not exactly sure what their dynamic was, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure even if we, uh, if anyone knows exactly what happened, if it was actually documented, how the relationship panned out. So I'm not sure, maybe someone can, uh, someone knows this, I don't know, but it seems to me that uh, it was just such a huge project that, of course, I suppose that Gaudi had to approve of everything or, or disprove of everything, but it's not necessarily the case that he uh, was maybe directly involved in every detail yeah, of the yeah. picture. Um, I mean, even, even if that example is not quite right, the idea of teaching someone to emulate the style, I think is very interesting regarding AI art creation as well. So, sorry, tell me if I'm getting too far off topic here, but. So basically, at the moment, I'm trying to train ChatGPT to write like I do. So the idea eventually will be to me just to have a conversation with ChatGPT about a paper I'm trying to write. And then I say, OK, you know what I write like? Write a paper about what we've talked about in this style. I also know a poet, a published poet, who's reasonably successful in Belgium. And I'm not allowed to tell you his name, because what he has done is he has trained this sort of model to emulate his style perfectly. And he now sells poems under his own name that he has made using the, the system, uh, emulating his style. And then you want to say, well, who is authoring? Yeah, where? how much credit should we be giving the AI in that type of case? So, yeah, I'm afraid, sorry, that's a lot of words to say. I don't really know what to say about this sort of stuff right now. But this these sorts of ideas are very, very interesting and definitely worth pursuing by that, one of us, perhaps. So thank you. Thank you. We still have a little bit of time. Xenia, would you like to kind of have a follow-up? Follow follow okay, it's a, just a follow-up on Emma's question. Mm -hmm. So yes, authorship is definitely a huge issue with AI models. And I I wouldn't be so fast on agreeing that um, it's not kind of stealing because um, yeah, because it is trained on enormously large data, which is basically most of it is in public domains. Domain, so it's not clear how the failed to occur if everybody is free to use it. But uh, in the case of Gaudi, uh, it was his apprentices. He personally trained them. And mm -hmm. now we have a team of people who have nothing to do with art, who do not understand art as we do, and uh, who are just uh, on observing patterns and who are feeding this just like enormously large amount of data into the algorithm. And I don't think it's kind of the same process. I, I, my intuition that it's not because Gaudi, at least, he taught his students a craft and he taught his style personally. I, I, I think this connection here is quite different. The, um, why? I guess would be my, I mean, because it's, because it is sort of a one-to-one -one teaching relation or because it's, or because it's him teaching agents, teaching people rather than using an algorithm. Well, I think, uh, I think his style uh, is something that he, that he crafted in himself. It is this process of transformation when you make your first work of art and it, uh, you look at it and you think, oh my God, this looks horrible. And then you just continue improving yourself and it's a very hard work and a hard process. So he made himself and then he taught his students. And now we have what we have is basically, we have models that are, I'm sorry, spitting out what is essentially a remix of everything we ever made. I, I don't think it quite goes in the same but maybe I can write it in an email so I don't take everybody's time. If yeah, you don't, or, don't mind. Or me and Enrico can try and get our paper published and then you can publish a counter and then we can both get citations. That would also work very well. Um, I mean, briefly, I mean, this is the remix. I'd be interested to talk to you about the remix accusation because I just don't, I, I don't know, it doesn't seem... I, 
I mean, I sort of talked about this a little bit at the very, very end. It doesn't seem like stealing just because the, there's so much data to be drawn on from the from the prompter from the user. It doesn't. If if I was just copying or tracing or sampling in terms of music, then maybe there would be more more worries there. They did that actually. My, my my husband happens to be a music producer, and they they basically did they that they bought uh, uh, they bought a license to use enormously large uh, database of music mm. which people created, and now the whole industry is basically going and out. We lost of you. There are ways to use Mid Journey in creative and non-creative ways. I, I agree. Okay, so there is very. I mean, if I just typed in. Painting of a plant in the style of Anson Kiefer. I have not really done anything interesting or creative. Okay, I might be able to get something with beautiful formal properties out of that. But if you knew how it created it, you would not be terribly impressed. On the other hand, you do get people using this stuff very, very. You know, they take hours and hours and hours getting honing and coaxing things into. And yeah, they are using a data set which other artists have been fed into. But at the same time, I think it's interestingly different to something like sampling in music. Okay. I think sampling in music is great, by the way. I've heard amazing songs made from samples. But I don't think it's just taking a chunk of a piece of art and remixing it like that. But maybe we can talk about this via email okay, or another call sometime. Okay. Thank you, though. Very interesting stuff. Do we have any other questions? OK. If not, and of course, thank you, Nick, for inviting everyone to share their thoughts with you via email. So in, in case the emails didn't get, uh, in case you don't have the address, feel free to let me know and I will. I will oh, certainly, yeah, it. send it to anybody who wants it, yes. Um, thank I, you. I was going to say, if you send me an email, I will reply, but I'm a slow player, so we'll see. Okay. Nick, thank you so much. This was really an enjoyable and for me personally, very mind opening. Uh, we wish you all the best with your project and I hope you do get published because we need good work with, with respect to what is happening in our artistic and philosophical practices. So thank you very much once again. Thanks to all the thank students you. and all the participants. And uh, yeah, if maybe my students can wait for just one minute uh, just to make some agreements for our classes tomorrow. Thank no you, Nick, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was really, really fun and really good questions. I really enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, I hope to hear from some of you soon. Thanks to the organizers as well. Thanks, Iris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.